good morning. We welcome you in Jesus' name to our service this morning on this November the 8th. We pray that the Lord is in your presence uh, and you are rejoicing in his presence every day. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you today for the privilege of being together. We thank you that we can worship you. Lord, in these troubled times, we pray that you might be the God who is our rock and our redeemer, that you are a refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. And so, Lord, as we um, come together to worship you, uh, we pray that your spirit would meet us in this hour. Strengthen us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to read together a responsive reading taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 96. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people right, uh, righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. God bless the reading of his word. The first song we're going to sing together as worship to the Lord is called Love Divine, All Loves Excel. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter Lost in wonder, love, and prayer. 
If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. Thanks for joining us in this worship service. We're thankful that you've come. And uh, we're in the midst of uncertainty in our country. I know Election Day was Tuesday, and as of this uh, taping, we still don't know who our president is going to be in the coming years. And we want to pray for our nation in that way, and we will. But we are in Genesis chapter 16. Last time we talked about the covenant of God with Abram. Uh, this is a little less of a spiritual chapter. Chapter 16 is a little more carnal, and uh, you'll see it as we go through this passage of Scripture. But I invite you to turn, with me, turn there with me. So we're going to read the whole chapter, Genesis chapter 16. My sermon is entitled, Life in the Flesh, A Struggle with Doubt, Impatience, Cruelty, and Pride. And then God steps in. <laughs> All right, so Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian handmaid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my handmaid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. So the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall give him the name or shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Ber Hal uh, Lahal Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh. And Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called his name, or named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today, and we pray your blessing upon your word. May we be strengthened by it. May we, we, may we be reminded of all that you have for us, and may we rejoice in the God who hears and sees us. Thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God had promised Abram descendants and the land in which he lived. It had been many years, in fact, ten years, since God proclaimed these things to him. Surely Abram told his wife Sarai, and they anticipated God's answer to his promise. But what do you do when God seems to tarry on his answer? Do you get anxious? Maybe you, particularly, have asked God for something you think is within his will, and you believe he's revealed what he's going to do, but it hasn't happened yet. What do you do? There are three people that are highlighted in this story. What did Abram, Sarai, and Hagar do? The New Testament describes the life of a believer as a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. What unfolds before us is a series of decisions that were made in the flesh and the intervention of God in the situation. So I'm going to mention five missteps and then we're going to talk about how God stepped in. The first misstep then is an attempt through human means to fulfill a promise that God had given. 
God had shown to Abram through numerous signs in several communications that he was going to make up make him a great nation. God had even told him in the present in the previous chapter that he was going to re- receive a son that would come from his own body. This was the covenant promise God gave and it was a supernatural promise because of Abram's and Sarai's barrenness. As we look at the text, humanly speaking, they were unable to bring about this promise. You can almost hear the pain in Sarai's voice when she says to Abram uh, in verse 2, So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. It is Sarai, Abram's wife then, who comes up with this idea and convinces her husband of an alternative plan to bring about God's promise. Now, I'm not suggesting that the women are always to blame. Men come up with what I call alternative plans as well. But in this case, it was Sarai who said to Abram, Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Paraphrasing her, Abram, if you go into my handmaid, Hagar, and conceive a child by her, then we can consider this our child. The ancient idea of surrogacy used the term at my knees in Genesis chapter 30. It was thought that if Sarai were present when Hagar gave birth and that the child was born, in essence, on her knees, that Abram and Sarai could consider the child their child. Sarai, at this point, doubted God's promise. Maybe she thought, God gave the promise to my husband, but maybe not to me. The second misstep, then, is going against God's principle of marriage in order to have a child. This was not God's plan. God instituted marriage as one man for one woman, and Abram and Sarai were meant for each other. A proper response by Abram to his wife could have been, Sarai, you are my wife, and God has promised us a heritage. Let's trust him even though we've waited this long already. They had waited 10 years. In reality, they're going to wait another 13 years. But what does Abram do here? He listens to the voice of his wife and takes Hagar as a wife. Consequently, he goes into her and she conceives a child. So what's the third misstep? The third misstep is a wrong attitude by Hagar to her mistress. Hagar is an Egyptian handmaid to Sarai. She was probably someone who was given to Abram while he was down in Egypt. We don't know if Hagar is a believer. When Hagar becomes pregnant, the scripture says that she despises her mistress. Now remember, Sarai was the one who came up with the plan. She must have figured that Hagar would go along with the plan, but instead, Hagar's attitude toward Sarai changed. Since bearing children was considered a blessing, Hagar now exhibits a proud attitude toward Sarai. In essence, Sarai has to live with the struggle, uh, potentially this thought, this infertility between my husband and me isn't my husband's issue, it's mine, because he has been able to have a child by Hagar. The fourth misstep is this, tension between Abram and Sarai. Sarai isn't happy with Hagar's attitude and she blames Abram for it. You got me into this situation, she might have said. And Abram leaves it up to her to do what she wants. Again, he doesn't act as a spiritual leader, nor stand up for Hagar. He allows a tough situation to get even worse. And when they act in the flesh, and when we act in the flesh, it affects our relationships. Here, the steps Abram and Sarai have taken have brought with it conflict between the two of them. Abram allows Sarai to solve the problem in her own way, rather than seeking to bring about peace between the two women. So the the fifth misstep is this, that Sarai deals harshly with Hagar. In fact, it's so harsh, the harshness is so intense, it's enough to make Hagar flee. And the picture we have now as we come out of this story is of a woman who is fleeing away. Now God enters in. The intervention of God is seen here. We've showcased at least five missteps and now God enters 
the picture. It seems that all through the events that have unfolded so far, none of the characters have asked God what to do, nor considered his ways. The text says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by a spring on the way to shore. And what does the Spirit of God do? Listen to what it says. Verse 8. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm not sure about you, but sometimes there's been a situation where police officers have found a runaway or found some child that's lost and the, and the police officer would ask that kind of question. Son, daughter, where did you come from and where are you going? Well, if the child's running away, he thinks he's going to go somewhere away from the problems he has. But the police officer usually finds where he's come from and the police officer will bring him back. This is the first time in the scriptures that the phrase, the angel of the Lord, is used. We understand this to be a physical presence of God before a human being. It is, I believe, the second person of the Trinity in pre-incarnate form. Later in the New Testament, that second person of the Trinity becomes the Word, the Word of God. He becomes the Word made flesh who dwelt among us, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in essence, it is Jesus before he became to earth as Jesus. He enters this picture. Uh, the biblical form of this occurrence is called a theophany. And so Jesus shows himself, God himself shows himself to Hagar. And he speaks to Hagar. And what's the first thing he says after he finds out where she's come from? She says to him, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. In her mind, uh, where did I come from? I, I came from the worst situation that possibly could be. This woman doesn't like me. She hates my guts. And where am I going? Anywhere to get away from her. But the spirit of the Lord, the, the, sorry, the angel of the Lord says this. He says, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Wow. Can you imagine Hagar's response? You want me to do what? <laughs> you want me to do what? You see, God saw Hagar. God heard Hagar. And God told Hagar that she needed to return. God encourages her to return to her mistress, but he also promises that she would have a son and even tells her the name she should give her son, which is Ishmael. It is the first recorded time when God tells someone what they should name their child. The name Ishmael means God hears, for God must have heard the cry of Hagar. God saw her in her distress. God answered her and gave her something to live for. He promised her that her son would be the beginning of many generations and many descendants. In this passage of scripture, we are given to us one of the names of God. It is El Roy. Now, El Roy is not the name of the son of George and Judy Jetsons from the cartoons, the Jetsons. This is God's name, El Roy. El, that is spelled E-L, is the generic name for God. And Roy, spelled R-O-I, means the one who sees. Christian contemporary artist Michael Carr wrote a song entitled El Shaddai. It was made popular by Amy Grant. Maybe you remember it. In one of the verses, Michael Carr writes this, To the outcast on her knees, you were the God who really sees. And those words, the phrase in that song, comes from this story. Isn't it great to know, my friends, that regardless of the heartache we may feel, regardless of the uncertainty we may experience, regardless of the feelings of being outcast at times, God sees. And we can be so bold as to personalize it and say that God sees us. God saw Hagar in her circumstance and in her need. And even the name God gave her to give her son, Ishmael, reminds us that God hears. God hears our sometimes even unspoken cries 
and he sees us. And what does God tell Hagar to do? She has run from her circumstances, and God goes and God tells her to go back and submit herself to her mistress. Are we much different? We may be facing difficult circumstances and may want God to transform our circumstances. We want to escape from those circumstances. But he doesn't often do that. Instead, he desires to transform us in in the midst of our circumstances. Let me say that again. He desires to transform us in the midst of our circumstances. God desires that Hagar's life be transformed. Again, we don't know if Hagar was a believer at this time. But God is bringing her to himself and desiring that she might trust in him in the midst of what she was facing. God desires the same for us. If you've never trusted Christ before as your Savior, then God may be allowing your circumstances to, in your life in order that you may turn to him for salvation and guidance. If you are a believer, then he wants you to trust in him to bring you through the circumstances you are presently facing in your life. Well, the end of the story is that Hagar is reunited with Abram and Sarai. Hagar bears a son to Abram. It is the first, his firstborn son, and the child's name is given as Ishmael. And we're told that Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So what does God want to teach us in this story that's filled with carnality, filled with missteps, filled with uh, life in the flesh by these individuals? Well, the first thing he wants us to know is that it, we cannot do spiritual work in the flesh. God has promised Abram that he would give him offspring. I believe that Abram, along with Sarai, were seeking to do God's will, but because of doubt and impatience, ended up doing it in their own flesh. It would take a supernatural work of God for Sarai to conceive, and it's not for another 13 years, when she will be 89 years old. Hagar certainly was much younger and was able to have children, so the natural way of looking at it seemed an easy way to fulfill what God had told them should happen. And they chose that natural way. But that's not the way we do spiritual work. Spiritual work is not done in the flesh. Instead, the Lord's work is to be done in the power of the Spirit of God and by waiting on the Lord for direction and provision. We are sometimes faced with questions of of believing God or simply doing what is the natural thing to do. There is a place in the Christian life for practicality, but God also wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. And that faith, that faith walk looks different than our natural eyes can see. That faith usually means waiting on God with patience. I've quoted this verse several times, but what does Isaiah 40, 31 say? They that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They they shall run, rather, and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here's an example that's shown itself several times, numerous times, in the Church of Christ. It's when a church decides that they need a building, whether it's a new building or a first building, whatever it is, and how are they going to finance that building? Well, oftentimes we are in a hurry. Oftentimes, we're impatient to get it done. And the churches go into a large amount of debt in order to pay for their building. They end up leaving a generation of people to pay the outstanding mortgage in the coming years. But if God is truly leading the congregation to build, then couldn't he provide in a supernatural way for their resources to be given before any construction began? A mortgage seems like such a practical thing, but I have, I have served churches and spoken with other churches who have struggled with the mortgage payment. Certainly, ministries that could have taken place have, have been stifled because of the burden of a mortgage. 
Now that's just one illustration. We could come up with numerous illustrations from church life. But let's get a little more personal. How many times have you or I made decisions based on what our flesh might want to do over what the Spirit of God may be prompting us to do? A concrete example is how do we respond when another per- to another person when they come to us with a conflict? Do we respond in the natural way by becoming defensive or argumentative? Or do we seek to maintain oneness by responding in a spirit of gentleness and kindness? You see, the Lord's work is to be done in the power of the Spirit and by waiting on the Lord for direction and provision. The final thing I want to say is that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The conflict between this son of Abram, Ishmael, and the son who would come later, the son of promise named Isaac, has been going on for centuries. It is Israel versus the Arabs. If you look at the Middle East today, that's the conflict that continues to go on. And ironically, they don't get along even up to this day, even though they are brothers. They're both sons of Abraham. Well, God's promise here to Hagar is a sign of his redemptive purpose for Ishmael and his offspring. God desires to save all mankind, including the Arabs. God could have easily allowed Ishmael to die, but he didn't. Instead, he gave Hagar a promise that there would be many descendants from Ishmael. So we can conclude that the message of the gospel is for all humanity. Let us be sure to include any and everyone in the message we proclaim, the gospel message that we proclaim and live out in our lives. Let me just say one other thing. The story here tells us that Hagar had a vision from God. The spirit of the angel of the Lord appeared to her. And even to this day, when you speak to Arabs, and specifically those that have been uh, in Islam, and when they turn to Jesus Christ, their testimony is oftentimes filled with a story of a vision they had of God coming to them. So God still shows himself to the Arabs and he still desires that they be saved. So we need to love them, too. So what does this passage teach us? Well, let me conclude by quoting the Apostle Paul from Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, where he simply says this, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God bless you as you walk in the Spirit day by day. Amen. We're going to spend a few moments in prayer uh, as we bring before uh, the Lord our concerns. So let me just turn to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you today for the privilege of prayer. We thank you, Lord God, that we can come before you as your people and we can bring our request to the throne of grace, boldly to the throne of grace, there to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And today, Lord God, beyond all the, the, the uh, prayer requests that we've had for people, and we've prayed for people every week, I want to pray specifically for our nation today. We are a nation that is divided. And Lord, in regards to the whole situation with the presidential election and all the other uh, elections in senates and in the senate and the house and and all the way down to the local elections lord we need you we are reminded of this promise from the name that was given to you by hagar you are the god who sees and we're reminded because of the name that hagar gave her son ishmael that you hear and so, Lord God, we pray that you would hear us today and that you would see us in our, in our distress as a nation and that we would turn to you in this time, Lord, and find in you the refuge and strength that we need. 
Lord, may you cause righteousness and justice and equity to win out. May you win the, the victory over evil. And Lord God, I pray that you would, you would uh, cause us to see that this is not a battle between flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so, Lord God, we call upon you, the great God of gods and King of kings and Lord of lords, that you would win the victory in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm in our nation. And may this be a time when we turn to you and find our refuge in you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for our nation. We thank you for uh, the people of Tamiami Village, Tamiami Fellowship, and our friends and family that are a part of this particular fellowship. And we pray your blessing upon them and the needs that they have today. So we love you today, God. We bless you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The next song we like to sing is number 154 in our hymnal. It's just a, an actual chorus. It's taken from John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. We'll sing it together. One more song, and you might want to stand for this one. It's Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. appreciate your good singing today. We're thankful that you've joined us in worship. Receive the benediction. And now may the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, 
your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, Alleluia, Alleluia, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and